afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. I am your host, Chris Smith. I'm with the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. And today we've got an exciting program for you. Uh, and it's exciting in a lot of ways. There's a lot going on with today's Lunchtime Discovery program. I happen to be broadcasting from a ranger office at the O'Connell Lefty Visitor Center in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. How cool is that? Uh, I've been traveling all this last week with a group of North Carolina teachers and other museum staff all along the Blue Ridge Parkway, exploring the wilds of North Carolina. Uh, we started up here in Stone Mountain State Park, and today we have completed the parkway, the North Carolina section, uh, and I'm now at the end at the Econo Lefty Visitor Center. So that's exciting. Hopefully the uh, National Park Service wireless internet connection will hold up and I'll be able to remain as part of today's program. But also we've got another interesting internet connection happening because with us today is Eric Lund. Eric is the paleontology lab manager for the Museum of Natural Sciences and Eric is joining us from the, or close to the middle of nowhere in Utah. Eric, welcome. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Good to be here. So, uh, so glad that we could bring you into this program, Eric. The Lunchtime Discovery Series, we've got students and teachers, environmental educators, environmental professionals from all across North Carolina who tune in and watch the show. Oh, and folks, no matter what group of folks you know, you're a part of joining the show today. Remember that you can leave your questions, comments, and thoughts for Eric as we go throughout today's program in the chat, whether you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, and we'll get to those because we're going to do an audience Q&A a little bit later. Um, but Eric, you've got some beautiful scenery behind you. Where are you particularly? So we are in uh, South Central Utah, uh, here in this beautiful place, we're looking at a package of Cretaceous rocks uh, that we're focusing on sort of a time frame between 140 million years ago and 95 million years ago uh, in this beautiful state of Utah. Gorgeous. I, I really can't get enough of the view back there. It is spectacular. So... Why are you in Utah? We're in Utah looking at these particular packages of rocks because we're really interested in what the animals during this time were doing here on Earth, 140 to 95 did you have me or did I lose you? I lost you for a second. You still there? Yep. Go ahead. My apologies. Great. Yeah, so we're out here uh, in this particular part of Utah because there's a package of rocks called the Cedar Mountain Formation. And these, uh, this package of rocks contains animals that we know very little about. So that's why we're out here trying to find them, uh, dig them up, and learn everything we can about uh, the Cretaceous of Utah 140 to 95 million years ago. One hundred forty to nine. Found anything uh, particularly exciting on this expedition so far? Uh, we have. We've got pieces of small meat-eating dinosaur, big meat-eating dinosaur, and a whole bunch of uh, uh, of a early iguanodontian called Eolambia. And uh, just off the cliff uh, in front of me here. Uh, we have a quarry where we're digging up a baby Eolambia. And just the other day, we found uh, a small lower jaw that's only about uh, 10 centimeters long, uh, which was really exciting when we found that. Um, other, other than that, we've got pieces of turtle. Uh, we collected uh, um, a nearly complete turtle when we first got out here. Uh, we got pieces of croc. Um, and then uh, the rest of the team is out trying to find... Uh, more of anything that we can we can find from these rocks. So give us a little insight into the process that the team goes through from uh, like, how do you 
cutting out a little bit there, Chris. Give eight thumb all the way to getting them back to Raleigh. Yeah, so you're cutting you out, but I think you're little... asking. I okay. think you're asking about the process. Um, yeah, so first of all, we got to be in the correct package of rocks. So we're interested in all the terrestrial rocks, um, rocks that contain animals that lived on land. Um, so we look at geologic maps, figure out where those are, and we go to those places. Uh, and then <clears throat> we try to figure out, uh, once we find terrestrial rocks, that they are of the age that we want. Um, and then just happens to be here in Utah. So once we get here, then we just start walking the land, uh, looking for bone and anything eroding out uh, of, of the rocks. Um, and so we'll walk up and down the hills. We'll walk across the hills looking for any pieces of fragment of bone or anything else, plant fossils that are coming out. And once we find a site, uh, then we dig in a little bit, dig in and try to expose, find the horizon where everything's eroding out. And uh, most often, there's nothing left. All the pieces that we have found, that's all there is. Occasionally, we get lucky. And as we dig in, we find more and more. Um, we want to expose everything on a plane. Um, we don't want to mine into the, into the rock because then we risk damaging the fossils. But if we bring everything down in a flat plane, then as stuff gets uh, uncovered, we can see it. Uh, and then once everything is uh, uncovered, uh, we have to apply consolidants. Um, these, these bones are millions of years old, and this is the first time they've seen daylight in those millions of years. So we get everything from really nice solid pieces of bone to powder. Um, and in order for us not to damage them as we're trying to excavate them, we put on, put on a glue basically to help hold everything together. Uh, and then we got to get those bones out of the ground. So we pedestal. Uh, so we dig a trench around those bones. So now your bone is sitting on a pedestal of rock. Um, and then we start, depending on the size of the jacket, we put plaster and burlap uh, or uh, just plaster impregnated bandages uh, over those fossils, create a cap, um, and then we break it off that pedestal, flip it over, completely encase it in plaster and burlap or uh, bandages. Uh, and then if it's small enough, we throw it in our backpack and hike it back to camp. Uh, if it's larger, we'll put it on an EMT stretcher board and get a bunch of us uh, around this thing and we'll haul it out that way. Uh, but if we just can't pick it up, uh, we got a couple jackets that are in excess of several hundred pounds and it's just not feasible for a team of us to pick it, pick those things up. So we'll put it in a helicopter net and we'll fly it out, um, fly it out to a trailer. Uh, and then in our case, we'll drive it back to North Carolina. That sounds uh, very exciting. It also sounds like a whole lot of work. Oh, it is. it is. It takes a lot of work to get a dinosaur out of the ground. I don't, I don't think the movies have quite captured exactly how much work it is. <laughs> they have not. Like, they got the scenery right, but uh, the amount of sweat, it sounds like, that goes <laughs> into this. The it? amount of sweat and broken tools and buried trucks, they don't show that part in the movie. <laughs> they didn't show you digging out a, a truck. <laughs> stuck in the mud in the desert that's for sure so when you're looking around then uh, and spotting fossils how do you know what's going to be a good site to then try to dig in and and search for more fossils yep, so yeah great question so once we find a site and there is more material we'll dig a test pit so we'll go out along that horizon uh, and we'll dig several test pits and see if there is more bone uh, and if the bone quality and uh, bone density within that layer is high enough, uh, then we will um, collect what we can that's at risk for uh, eroding away. Uh, and then we'll protect the site uh, and then apply for our um, federal excavation permits and, and come back next year and really open up a big hole um, and dig into the hill and, and, and try to get the, the animal out. When you start to excavate, do you ever uh, feel like maybe there's like uh, there's good fossils that you really want, and then maybe fossils that you don't want so much, or do you take just everything that you can find? Like, do you yeah, just we, want a T. Rex foot, or do you take everything? Nope, we try to take everything because that really we're trying to build the whole picture. Um, so unlike 
several hundred years ago, they were just out head hunting um, and would leave the rest of the body. We really want to understand the biology and the ecology of these animals. So we, we really want to take everything that we find, even the tiny scraps, um, because that helps us tell the story of how this particular quarry came to be, because we want to understand the life and death of these animals. Um, we want to understand uh, the geology um, that's out here. So we, we try to take everything. So you're getting big animals, small animals. Uh, do you also collect um, the, the things like plant material if you find them, plant fossils? We do. We do. We try to um, collect the plants if we find them in the quarry, especially if they're associated with the bones um, or near the quarry, because that really helps us um, build out that full ecological picture of how these animals lived and died. And so if you're finding lots of, lots of different species uh, of animals, you've got lots of different plants and you're putting this picture back together. How do you actually begin to then understand like what this place that looks like a desert behind you was like, yeah, 120 million years ago. Yep. So, um, we combine all the biological data, all the ecological data that we collect with all the geological data. And the rocks also help us tell a story. So the rocks we're digging in right now, we know they were deposited um, by rivers uh, on floodplains. And so a lot of mudstones and sandstones out here. So we know that during the Cretaceous, 140 million years ago, this was uh, an area that was very wet, very verdant, um, very green, humid, very warm. Uh, um, and so using all those bits of information that helps us start to reconstruct um, the environment uh, 140 million years ago. It doesn't look very verdant and green today. <laughs> it is not. <laughs> Although the last, last uh, week or so, we've had huge rainstorms. Didn't make it verdant, but it made it very humid and wet. Oh, wow. What, what do you do when you're out in the desert in a in big rainstorms? How do you how do you look for fossils then? Yeah, so we can't work when it's raining because uh, everything turns to mud, uh, and then we risk damaging the fossils. So really, we just gotta hightail it back to camp and hunker down as a group in our in our uh, cabin tents uh, that we got set up here. Or people go off to their own personal tent and we read, um, play games. Um, so we find time, find a way to pass the time as it's raining. It's, uh, it's been raining on us the last couple of days here in the Blue Ridge Mountains, too. Uh, but we just uh, keep hiking. Of course, we're not <laughs> trying to haul out the very fragile and priceless dinosaur fossils. So, Eric, what brought you to the museum uh, and, and now has you out in Utah, are there particular dinosaurs or fossils of other animals that you're hoping to find? Uh, or do you have like a, a specialty that you're looking for out in Utah? Yeah, so what brought me to North Carolina is uh, Dr. Lindsay Zano, the director of our program. I've known Dr. Zano uh, since 2000. Uh, went to school together way back when. Um, and then she uh, had this little project you may have heard of called the Dueling Dinosaurs coming to North Carolina. Um, so she brought me in uh, for this little project to be the, uh, the manager of the brand new lab um, being designed and built for that project. Um, and then what brought me out to, to Utah here uh, is this whole project um, under Lindsay Zano. Um, she's interested in the meeting dinosaurs. Um, I'm personally interested in the horn dinosaurs. So the horn dinosaurs from this particular package of rock uh, in this spot here in Utah we don't know uh, anything about. Uh, we suspect they should be here. Um, we have uh, horned dinosaurs from this time period, other places in the world. So it uh, makes sense that they would be here as well, um, but we just don't know much about them. So I am particularly interested, interested in figuring uh, out their story uh, and where they are, but we have been having a heck of a time trying to find any horned dinosaur stuff. Okay, so when you say horned dinosaurs, uh, any species that folks might be familiar with or maybe yeah, so, related ones that folks know? 
Yep. So uh, when I speak of horned dinosaurs, I mean animals like Triceratops. So Triceratops uh, is hundreds of million years younger uh, than uh, what we're dealing with here, but in the same family. So those animals that had all the, the fancy horns and, and stuff coming off their heads. Okay, so horns and frills, uh, but herbivores instead of carnivores, like uh, Dr. Zano's favorite. Yep. Well, that works out. We've got a, we've got a meat-eating dinosaur expert and a plant-eating dinosaur expert all in the same lab now. Yes, yes. Good, a good team makes for a good team. But you said you've been having a little bit of trouble trying to find horned dinosaurs. Uh, is it maybe just you're not in the right spot, you think, or uh, are there other factors at play? Yeah, it could be just that they were, um, could be that we're just not finding them, that they weren't very well preserved here, or that they were such a small component of this environment uh, that, that their fossils are few and far between. Um, but just yesterday, we found a site that produced uh, our very first Ceratopsian tooth. So we're very excited about that. Um, but that's, that's our first window into that they're here. Um, but yeah, they, they could just not be preserved. They could, we could be looking in the wrong stratigraphic section. We could be too high or too low. Um, they could just not be uh, eroding out yet. Uh, or they could be such a small component uh, of the system that they are just few and far between. Okay, now that last bit is, is interesting to me to think that there are, there are animals that were a part of this landscape that we may never know about just because they wouldn't, may not have fossilized or may not have fossilized or been such a small component or lived in an environment that's not conducive to fossilization. Um, and so they just didn't preserve um, or are so, so poorly preserved in the fossil record that um, we may not, we may not find but little bits of them. So we really, so we probably won't ever have a, a full picture of what these ecosystems were like just because there was probably going to be things that we'll never know about. Yeah, exactly. So we won't get 100%, but we'll do our best to get real close. I know the team will. Uh, so tell us a little bit about some of the specific finds that you've made. Uh, like I've heard about a nice turtle that you found. Uh, yeah, so in one of our quarries that we've been working on for the last three years, um, we opened up another section of it this year. Um, but instead of finding dinosaur stuff, we found uh, a beautiful mud turtle. Um, shell is probably about um, a foot, foot across. Um, it was a little bit broken up, but we have both the top shell, the carapace, and the bottom shell, the plastron. Um, there was not really any signs of any post cranius, so arms, hands, uh, and legs. Um, but that's not to, to say that they aren't tucked in the shell there, because um, we found found top shell and bottom shell and then we just trenched around it like i explained um put a plaster jacket on it and carried it up the hill um but yeah really it's it's quite well preserved other than being a, a little bit broken up um so we're really excited to get that back to the lab i think don't we have a, a fossil turtle expert in the lab too don't we we do yeah so lisa herzog our operations manager loves turtles so we thought she'd be excited about this find. Yeah, I'm excited about it. And Jump in, Lisa. Cool I want to hear it. what you yeah. have to say about the picture. <laughs> I'm interested to see if it's the same species as what I studied during my for my master's. So I'm interested to look at it. And it, Eric's right. Sometimes once we prepare out a, a shell and carapace, the, some of the limbs are tucked on the inside. And I even prepared a turtle once a long time ago that had a skull inside the, the shell. So maybe it's there. Fingers crossed. Yeah, we, we hope so. <laughs> yeah, that would be really cool. That is fascinating. I love that a uh, hundred million years later, there's still a turtle tucked up <laughs> inside a shell wa waiting to be untucked and explored. 
So, uh, Eric, how much longer will you be out in Utah? Uh, where are you at in this expedition? Yep. So we're uh, coming to an end here in Utah. We got about five more days. Uh, and then uh, I lead the team uh, farther north up into Montana to work in uh, much younger rocks. So we're going from the early Cretaceous all the way to the end Cretaceous when we go to Montana. So five more days here in Utah. Oh, nice. So you're just sort of going to follow the timeline as you move north. That's right. Yep. And so I, I, you would expect them to find a lot of different things, or do you think you'll just see, you know, uh, an early meat-eating dinosaur, and then you go and you find a later meat-eating dinosaur, or are these environments and species just completely different? Well, they are different, but same same components. So you're right. So we will have uh, similar uh, duckbill dinosaurs um, like Eolambia, which we find here in Utah. But we'll get uh, much more derived animals uh, when we go to Montana. And then um, as far as the meeting dinosaurs go, here we have animals like Siach uh, and Moros. Um, so early members of the Tyrannosaur family. Uh, but in the Hell Creek of Montana, we get the king the tyrant king himself, Tyrannosaurus rex. Um, and then as far as the horned dinosaurs go, we get uh, Triceratops. Um, and so I'm particularly excited about that, especially because we'll be digging up a Triceratops while we're out there. So yeah, same components, um, very similar environments, um, but there is uh, differences between, between the animals. We do see evolution going from early Cretaceous to the end Cretaceous in all these groups. I, I like that comparison of uh, looking at earlier species and then later versions of them, uh, you know, seemingly as you see evolution happening. Um, but, but also what you were talking about earlier with um, the way that you can look through time and see species change but you're also looking through space in the way that the environments around you are constructed. Yep, exactly. And uh, try to get at that by looking at the rocks again um, and, and really building that whole ecological picture. Cause we know during this time, during the Cretaceous North America was divided in half by a large seaway. So we would have been standing here in oceanfront property um, looking out to a vast seaway. Um, and we know uh, towards the end of the Cretaceous, when we head up into Montana, that seaway is receding. Um, and so we're seeing the rocks change as well. We're getting less mudstones. We're getting more sandstones as, as, as the, the beach and rivers push out following, following that ocean. So, yeah, we put everything together to try to create the big picture. You know, I'm really getting a sense that to be a paleontologist, you have to know a whole lot more than just uh, just about dinosaurs or just about whatever fossil or, or ancient creature is your specialty dinosaurs or turtles maybe you've got to yeah, know that, geology and biology yep so it it pays to know a little about a little bit about a lot of things or a lot of stuff about a particular thing uh and then if you don't know something and you try to collaborate with those who do so we don't it's not just us out here we we collaborate with, with other colleagues who are strictly geologists or strictly ecologists, and they help us think about this place and these animals in a different way and, and help us build a better picture of what was going on. What is your background, Eric? Uh, you talked about like being in, in school with Dr. Zano, but how did you come up into paleontology? Yeah, so I was, when I first started my uh, university career, I was better at rocks than I was at the biology. So I did the geology route. So I'm a geologist by training, um, but my soon to be PhD will be uh, in biological sciences. So I've tried to add in that biological component uh, to try to round everything out. A lot of times when we do these programs, uh, we have folks watching who aspire to be paleontologists. Any good advice for those folks? Yeah, I would, I would say uh, get involved at your local museum, see what they have to offer. Um, I started out as a volunteer at the 
Utah Museum of Natural History, now the Natural History Museum of Utah. Um, so I just started out as a volunteer in the prep lab, uh, and now I'm out here, a uh, professional paleontologist digging up stuff. So I would say go check out uh, your local groups, local museums, see what they have to offer. Uh, and then just read a whole lot of things, not just about dinosaurs, um, but read something about geology, ecology, um, and just stay curious. Mm, just stay curious. Do we have paleontology volunteers in Raleigh? We do. We do. We have, um, well, due to the pandemic, that's been kind of scuttled a little bit, but we do mm. have a volunteer program uh, at the museum. Uh in, in all departments, but we do have one for paleontology. Um, and so hopefully once I get back and we're all back together, we can um, hopefully get the museum uh, and the lab back open to volunteers and start bringing on a new, uh, a new team to help us uh, look at these things and open up these jackets that we're collecting right now. Excellent stuff. Are there ways for people to be able to participate in paleontology um, I guess from anywhere, like are there community or citizen science programs in paleontology? There are. Um, and one of the things that uh, we're trying to do right now as part of the Doing Dinosaurs is a citizen science um, community engagement called uh, Cretaceous Creatures, where we'll be sending out uh, bags of uh, concentrated fossiliferous sediment to middle schools uh, all over North Carolina, hopefully every middle school in North Carolina, and get uh, those students to help us collect our data. Um, so pick through the sediment, pick out the fossils, help us identify them, help us take measurements, uh, upload them to a big database, uh, and get involved with us that way so they can be a part of the Dueling Dinosaurs project. Uh, otherwise, there are um, other citizen science projects. There's uh, shark tooth forensics uh, that uh, Dr. Terry Gates with NC State runs. So that's another way to uh, get involved uh, in paleontology. Uh, and then I do know of other uh, institutions. Uh, uh, Casper College in Casper, Wyoming has, has such programs. Um, so there's various programs uh, over the nation that people can uh, check out and get involved in uh, and try their hand at paleontology. Excellent stuff. There you go, folks. Look some of those up. Get involved. Get interested. Eric, uh, I've got one more question for you, and then I'm going to turn it over to our viewers and see what questions they have. So, folks, be popping your questions into the chat. I've got them pulled up right here, and it looks like we've got a lot of good questions coming in, but we can probably – we'll do as many as we have time for today. Uh, Eric, what's your favorite part, your favorite thing about being a paleontologist? Yeah, it's getting to spend time out here. Uh, in the middle of nowhere, and it's that uh, sense of adventure and discovery. Um, finding and being the first person to see a particular fossil in hundreds of million year, millions of years uh, is, is my favorite part. It must be exhilarating to, I mean, even you mentioned finding a ceratops tooth, and you've got like just one small I don't know how big they would have been or small, but just one <laughs> It piece. is. It's tiny. Okay. It's so teeny. you find one. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's teeny tiny. <laughs> so you find one small thing, but uh, I just have this idea that it must be really exhilarating, exciting. It is. That. Yeah. It, it is fantastic. It's that sense of discovery. Um, I mean, growing up, I always dug in my backyard trying to find you know, whatever I could. So now uh, I get to be out here and, and do that for a living. So uh, it's really great. And you get to do it for us at the museum so that we That's can all right. share in it as well. I love that. All right, folks. I've got your questions pulled up. I want to know what you want to know more about. Uh, so let's see. The first question that I see in our chat is, did T-Rex have feathers or not? <laughs> well, that's, that's a, a hotly debated topic. Did T-Rex have feathers or not? Um, so based off of, uh, there hasn't been a T-Rex specimen in North America uh, discovered with feathers yet. Um, 
but from other Tyrannosaurs, um, mostly from China, we know that they had at least downy integument when they were juveniles. Um, and so we hope to uh, be able to add to that with the dueling dinosaurs uh, and the juvenile uh, Tyrannosaur that is uh, a part of that uh, group of dinosaurs. Um, so that that is a, a particular question that depending on who you ask, the answer will be yes or no. <laughs> or maybe. <laughs> yes, no, or maybe. Okay. <laughs> That's why we need more scientists and more paleontologists. That's right. It's going to need more work and more specimens. All right. Let's see. Our viewer Charlie writes, how often do you get tips of an area where there might be fossils, or is it just a matter of going to the right area and searching yourself? Yeah, occasionally we'll get people um, email us uh, with, hey, I think I found something. Most of the time they just have a rock, but occasionally they actually have found some fossil um, and have taken adequate pictures of it and, and hopefully GPS. Um, so it, it does happen, um, but otherwise it's mostly just um, using what we know uh, about where the particular package of rocks that we're interested in outcrops uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, and then going to those and looking. Um, but it, it has happened where um, a farmer or someone out hiking um, will find fossils eroding out um, and let us know that they're there. Excellent stuff. All right, Ruth is asking if there's any way to find out what the atmospheric temperatures and carbon dioxide levels were like there and then. There are, there are. So um, throughout this formation, um, there are carbonate minerals um, that we can analyze for oxygen 17, oxygen 18. So um, we build upon uh, the isotope work um, that some uh, isotope geochemists do. And that will give us an idea of uh, what the, uh, the atmosphere was like, oxygen levels, water flow, evaporation rates, all things like that. So yeah, we can we can we can get information related to that. Okay, so even more information to help you reconstruct these ancient environments. Yep, exactly. That's really impressive. That's good. That's fascinating about how much information you can get from the rock and from the fossils to actually, I mean, completely reconstruct uh, the, these ancient places. Especially yep. since they're so different from today. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you just got to have uh, an idea and then go and see if you can find the data that supports that idea and help you, help you flesh it out. Does it? Okay, I've got one. Uh, do some of these things feel like, uh, like I don't want to say like an instant discovery, but, you know, do you like crack open a block of fossils and then go, oh my gosh, 140 million years ago, this place was an ancient river? Or is it bringing it back to the museum? Is it, you know, like years of measuring and analyzing and writing that, that pieces all of this together? Or do you get a sense of it like really quick? Um, I, say, I say both ways. So being out here, okay. having a uh, geological background, I can uh, basically read the rocks a little bit, um, be able to construct at least a, a hypothesis of what the environment was like. Um, and then it's going and collecting uh, bits of those rocks, uh, taking them back to the lab, and then doing some more in-depth analysis of them, um, as well as the fossils. So we know that these particular dinosaurs were here, but uh, and we know that the, the, what the rocks are that um, they are fossilized in, but we want to know how that particular package of uh, or particular fossil came to be. Uh, and so that really is um, collect it, try to collect as much data as we can on site, but then get it back in the lab and do a bit more fine, uh, fine scale analysis of those things and, and try to either uh, uh, bolster our hypothesis or change our minds about what we thought the environment was like or what the dinosaurs were like. So yeah, it happens both ways.
you lose, Chris. I have a question, Eric. Yes. Seems like Chris is gone. Uh, earlier, yeah. you, said, you said you found a juvenile um, eulambia, right? Yeah. And the jaw's about this big? Yeah, about so, 10 centimeters. Just a question on behalf of people who might not know, how big would an adult jaw be? So how can you tell that it's a juvenile? Yeah, so um, an adult jaw is probably on the order of 20 to 30 centimeters. Um, so yay big, about a foot. Um, foot long and so this one he's just a tiny guy does it have teeth in it so unfortunately uh no teeth in the actual jaw um but eldon one of our volunteers out here did find a, a loose eulambia tooth in the quarry um so hopefully because there's no teeth in the jaw and they fell out hopefully they're still in there uh, and we can uh, find them as we're going through the sediment nice I always love finding babies. I don't know why. They're so, <laughs> they're so cute. <laughs> because they're small and easy to carry. Yeah, that's right. I mean, small jacket. <laughs> we carried out from the other quarry. When, when I was out earlier this year, I, we carried out a rib that was from a sauropod and it weighed, I don't know, the jacket was probably 150 pounds. So, you know, it's nice to find those babies sometimes. That's right. <laughs> While we're waiting for Chris to get back online. I just had a question of, uh, I know y'all have been out there for what, 12 weeks now or something like that. Uh, what, what's been the biggest surprise find during that time that, that you know of at this point? Oh goodness. Um, well for me out here has been that ceratopsian tooth. That's, that's been really big. Um, probably for those who were out working, uh, North of the swell, uh, in another quarry called Crystal Geyser, perhaps it was um, either all the baby elements that they found or the sauropod stuff, um, the long neck dinosaur stuff from that quarry. Um, and then earlier in the season when we were uh, in uh, Northwest New Mexico, uh, again, we found a, a lot of really cool stuff. Um, but for me, it was uh, some ceratopsian stuff. So we found the occipital condyle uh, of a horned, of horned dinosaur uh, so the occipital condyle is the part that attaches the backbone to the head. Um, I found a, a beautiful one of those. So that, that's, that was very exciting for me. Uh, that, that's, that's really cool. Uh, looks like Chris is trying to get back in. So I'll see if I can admit him. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Because I'm interested in, in live animals too. Uh, you're in a neat area. What, what are some of the interesting critters you have around your camp there that you encounter? Oh yeah, very good. So um, there's been a baby rattlesnake uh, oh, right. hanging out, <laughs> hanging out near our camp. Uh -huh. uh, we see him every now and then. Of course, haven't seen him for past week. It's been rainy, um, but we got we got a whole gambit of jackrabbits and little cottontails, uh, chipmunks, a whole slew of, of lizards out here. Um, and then in the in the next valley over, we got a family of antelope uh, that we see every now and then. Um, so. Uh, Lots of, lots of great animals, um, lots of uh, beautiful birds out here, a couple of hawks, uh, ravens, crows. Um, so, yeah, the, the animal life out here is, is fantastic. Well, for, for, for me, that would be a distraction because, you know, I'd, I'd be <laughs> interested in the fossils, but I'd also be chasing those lizards down. And that, that, that rattlesnake is uh, real exciting. Very nice. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. a cute little guy. Nice. What, what species is it? Do you know? I don't know. Nope. Yeah. Send us a photo and we'll get an ID for you. Okay. I can I think I took a picture of him yeah, when we nice. first got here when I first saw him. So nice, nice. It look it looks like Chris, are you back with us? We'll see for how long. Okay. All right. Take it away. All right. So sorry about that, everybody. That's what you get for trying to host a show from the mountains. Okay, but there's lots of questions here, so I'm excited to get to them. Uh, and we'll do, we'll probably do about five more minutes if that works for you, Eric. Yeah, that's great. Okay, here we go. Do you worry about people coming in and stealing fossils? Mm, good question. So out here, no, because we are so far off the beaten path that someone would have to work really hard uh, to come out here uh, and find our fossils. Um, so out here, we don't have to worry about it. Um, but when I was in Madagascar in 2012 doing field work, um, Basically, there was a village. We were surrounded by villages, and 
particular fossil site was right along one of the main footpaths that these people use uh, to go to and from. And so we did worry about it there. Um, so we hired one of the local uh, gentlemen from, from one of the villages, uh, and he camped out there at night uh, and, and helped keep the, the site safe. Um, but out here, middle of nowhere, we, we don't have to worry about that. Good to know. Good to know. Okay. Uh, is there any similarity of Cretaceous fossils in Utah compared to North Carolina? Um, well, there's very little about Cretaceous North Carolina known. So that's one of those pieces that we need to try to fill in. Um, we, and, and the reason that is, is it's just, there's just no exposures because it's very verdant there, as you all know, lots of trees, lots of ground cover. And we really need the rocks to be exposed and stuff eroding out for us to find it. Uh, also, the problem is a lot of North Carolina is private land. Uh, and so we just don't have access to go out uh, and check it out. But in, in some of the river drainages, uh, it does. some of the river drainages do cut down through Cretaceous rocks. And we have gone out uh, and looked for stuff there. Um, but very little is known about uh, Cretaceous in North Carolina. Um, we have little glimpses in there. There's a uh, there's a duckbill dinosaur called Hypsobema um, that we have very scrappy material from. So we have, again, same components, uh, plant eaters, meat eaters, um, turtles, crocodiles. Uh, just we have to, to do a bit more work to, to, to find them in North Carolina. Okay, very interesting. Folks, I have to uh, keep a lookout on the museum's website for press releases on new discoveries from North Carolina. Okay, uh, let's see here. What conditions are necessary for dinosaurs, or I guess anything really, to fossilize? Uh, very good question. Um, so it's a very narrow uh, set of requirements uh, for fossilization to happen. So most things just won't fossilize. Um, but we gotta have basically rapid sedimentation where these animals died and are buried rapidly. Um, there's got to be a component of groundwater flow bringing in minerals, a um, bit of uh, an anoxic environment as well. Um, so things uh, can, can preserve. Um, and then, uh, you know, so if things sit out, if an animal dies and sits out on the land, it's going to become uh, predated and torn apart and spread across the land um, by those predators. So we need um, that high rate of sedimentation to bury things and for things to stay buried um, until we find them. Next good question, related a little bit, how do you identify a species based on just one fossilized bone? Yeah, so do a lot of comparative anatomy. Um, so we basically either, um, it's a lot of museum visits um, so going to museums that have collected from this area or have similar animals uh, and doing comparative anatomy. So comparing what you found to what they already have or what's already known uh, and really try to figure out if the, this new bump on this bone in this particular place is an actual feature or if it's just variation um, or if it's a pathology, if it was some disease. So uh, a lot of knowing a lot about different animals. Okay. Uh, and speaking of some of the animals that you've been finding, you mentioned the Eolambia, and Alex is wondering if this is the most common large animal out in the formations that the team is working in in Utah, like in the Mustn't Touch It. Uh, yeah, so uh, Eolambia is definitely one of the, the uh, I'm going to change change here a little bit um yeah eolambia is one of the the we found several of them this year um and so it is one of the biggest components uh, of this ecosystem right now um, and, and then beyond that is another dinosaur called an orodromine so another plant eater but much smaller in size think about uh instead of a uh an animal that was 16 feet long we now have an animal uh that was the size of a, a medium-sized dog um, so those are another big component uh, of, of this uh, Cretaceous ecosystem. Okay, very exciting finds. Well, Eric, I'm looking at the clock. 
And I think you've got more fossils to dig up to bring back to Raleigh. So That's I think right. I'll go ahead and, and let you get back to work. All right. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Right, thanks. Absolutely. My pleasure to learn all about what's happening. Uh, folks in the chat, uh, they're still posting questions. So one of these days we're going to have you back on so that we can get to even more questions and learn more about these animals and ecosystems from you. That sounds great. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning in to this edition of the Lunchtime Discovery Series with Eric Lund live from a dinosaur quarry in Utah. What fun, what exciting stuff. I hope that you learned a lot from today's program. Know that, yeah, we'll be back here next Wednesday at noon with a Lunchtime Discovery Series brought to you by us at the museum and the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality. Uh, make sure that you visit their website, eenorthcarolina.org to get more information about upcoming programs and the uh, Office of Environmental Education's everything that they've got going on. And of course, you can find out more about this program and see upcoming topics at naturalsciences.org. And if you like stuff like this, make sure that you're following the uh, paleo team who are tweeting. Let's see, Dr. Zano is tweeting from at Expedition Live. And you can also visit, uh, I think they're updating the Expedition blog, which is expeditionlive.org, I believe. I think it got posted in the chat a little bit earlier. Take a scroll and see if you can find it. Uh, and always, of course, you can follow the Museum of Natural Sciences on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as at Natural Sciences. And since you're already hanging out here on our YouTube channel, go ahead and click subscribe, click the bell, and then, boom, the next time we're bringing you another great program just like this one, you'll get the notification and you can come and join us. So, uh, from the Ranger Station in the Blue Ridge Mountains, I'm going to sign off and get back to that group of teachers who are about to have another amazing educational experience in Cherokee, North Carolina. And I'll see you all again real soon. Next Wednesday, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.